Disclaimer, this is all closer to science fiction than to science fact, but science fiction might be too harsh a term, at least for some of what I'm talking about. Some of it is frankly out there. Mostly it's philosophical speculation that has no basis or little basis in evidence. So don't take this as truth or as science, but rather as interesting ideas that could possibly be true. And it would be irresponsible of us to believe that they are true just because the ideas are cool. Anyway, on to the video. Time isn't a dimension, just as space isn't a dimension, but there are multiple dimensions of space, length, width, depth, and higher dimensions, possibly. So too, might there be more than one dimension of time? And even if there is only one dimension of time, it's more appropriate to say that there are three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, rather than calling time itself a dimension. Dimensions are the coordinates of things. One coordinate, one dimension. Two coordinates, two dimensions, and so on. Time and space are not themselves coordinates, but are the substances in which the coordinates exist. What we're certain of is that things happen within three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. That's to say that things change, happen, and appear along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis of space, and the x-axis of time, which is distinct from the x-axis of space. These dimensions are often all combined in what we call four-dimensional space-time. If string theory is true, then there are far more than just four dimensions, anywhere from 10 to 26. F-theory and some variations of M-theory have a 10-2 signature, meaning they have 10 dimensions of space and two dimensions of time. What would a second dimension of time look like? And is it possible that there are more than two? My mind immediately thinks of two main ideas of what other dimensions of time could entail. One for the y-axis of time and one for the z-axis. The first is time depth or time feel, which is how long you experience each moment to be relative to other moments of equal length as measured by a clock. It's how quickly you move along your own timeline. And the other idea is time width. It's parallel time. It's different timelines. And later in the video, we'll add those two together to make a three-dimensional box model of time, which will lead to the block universe and some truly wild ideas about consciousness. Ideas that I don't believe, but I find interesting. Let's start with time depth. If time as we normally think of it is linear, then we could call that first axis, the linear axis, the breadth of time or perhaps the length of time. So the second axis that I'm proposing would be the depth of time. It's time versus time feel. Time feel is the speed of one's progress along one's own timeline how long each moment feels compared to each other moment. It's how a moment can feel infinite. I'd visualize it with this graph. In the process of editing the script of this video, I came across a book called An Experiment with Time by J.W. Dunn. I haven't read it, but apparently J.W. Dunn talks about time depth as a second dimension of time and a few other ideas that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. I didn't steal this idea, at least, not consciously, so it's interesting to see that these ideas come up in people's minds independent of each other, which would suggest that they're either, one, truths about reality in some way or another, even if it's just metaphorical, or two, truths only about the way humans think. Which is to say that either time really does work this way, or humans just have a tendency to think time works this way, or they have an experience of it, even if that experience is just an illusion. I'm more inclined toward the latter, to be honest with you. And remember, the disclaimer at the beginning of this video is to remind us that whether or not time really works this way, we can't conclude that it's true without testing it first. If something is untestable, it might be true, but we can't claim to know that it is. But back to time depth. Most of the time, we tend to only think about time in one dimension, whether we truly experience it most of the time in only one dimension, or it only feels like we do. But sometimes, we experience moments that feel longer than others. We experience years that feel longer than others. This is possibly us delving into the depth dimension of time. But it also might not be the type of thing that's worthy of being called a different dimension of time, but rather just our psychological experience of time. However, it might be that it is another dimension of time. Perhaps conscious creatures have the ability to travel along another dimension of time so that we could say that our experience of certain moments feeling longer than others is in fact our experience of the depth dimension of time. For instance, a sentient life form, such as a plant, or even a non-living thing altogether, like a rock, 
does move through the length axis of time. It exists within time just as we do. It grows, it dies. But a plant, or a rock, most likely, doesn't measure moments. They don't experience time. They cannot look into a moment and stretch it out longer. But for humans, and I would also wager for other creatures, you can have two moments of time, both of which would be measured to be equal by a clock, but do not feel equal. Every moment contains a possible infinity, but most of the time we don't sink very deep into it. And sometimes we only skim the surface, shortening those moments even further. We have a default time depth that we experience, but this default doesn't necessarily have to be the same for all people. Similarly to how we can't really know if your blue looks the same as my blue, we can't really know if your moment feels the same as my moment. People might experience time at completely different baseline rates to other people or to other animals. It's just that our units of measurement are agreed upon. If we call it a second, I know how long that second feels, even if my second feels like 600 times longer than your second does for you. We've all had naturally occurring experiences that change our time depth. You get lost in an activity and hours feel like minutes, or you have to do some drudge work and one hour feels like five. Getting high changes this too. You're high for two hours, but it can feel like you've been high since the formation of the universe. And not only do we experience these fluctuations in time depth, our default time depth changes too, or at least it seems like it does. Moments felt longer when we were kids. They probably felt longer still when we were babies, and maybe like near infinities as newborns. And our default time depth keeps on creeping up and up, shorter and shorter as we age. Thinking of time depth in terms of weeks, months, or years gets us into the territory of Olika, the territory of the remembering self rather than the experiencing self. I've made a different video about the topic of Olika and time speeding up as we age, so check that out if you're interested. But roughly what Olika is, is the brain's tendency to delete redundant moments. This results in stretches of time spent in the same routine or without experiencing much novelty being compressed down into a single vague outline without much detail that has the effect of the last year of your life feeling like it just flashed by. The new and the different stands out in your memory. All else gets filtered out. You can easily recall the fact that you brushed your teeth. You might even be able to recall the actual specific memory of brushing your teeth on one or two occasions rather than just the generalized recognition that you've done it. But you certainly cannot remember every individual time that you've brushed your teeth. The same goes for really every other thing in your life. Your work days, what you've eaten, the conversations you've had, the times you've had sex, etc. But I think time depth should be measured on the level of moments rather than longer stretches of time such as years. We're talking about experience here rather than memory. We can consider the combination of regular time and time depth as time going up and down as well as across. This time depth would be the y-axis. But time might also go sideways or perhaps in four or more dimensions as well. But because this time feel is subjective and describes the speed of one's progress along one's own timeline, maybe this depth of time that I'm describing doesn't quite count as a second dimension of time. Time feel might not be the same thing as two-dimensional time. So for now, let's just put that aside and consider a different angle on the second dimension of time. Maybe it's good to think of it as parallel time. One-dimensional time is a line of time if we're to conceptualize it using space dimension terms that we already understand. There's already a question here of whether time goes in both directions or only one. But two-dimensional time would be a plane, allowing for non-causality. Or perhaps a better way to think about it would be it allows for multi-causality. There are two ways to think about this. Both of them are basically the same, but maybe one of them is more helpful to you. One, causality is the path that connects two points. And two, causality is the path that leads to any given point. Let's start with the first idea. On a one-dimensional model, there is only one possible way for any two points to be connected. In other words, an event in time can only lead to one outcome and will inevitably lead to that outcome. It's deterministic. The graph of one-dimensional time has only one possible shape. By adding just one more dimension of time, there is suddenly an infinite number of ways to connect two points. We can visualize this by drawing two points on a sheet of paper and drawing several ways that they might connect. In the second way, which is when we're just concerned with one point, 
On a one-dimensional model, it's the same. An event in time can only be caused by what came before it, or after it if time can be run backward. Place a point down, and it connects to the event in question somewhere along the line, and only in one way. All events are part of the equation of causality. The universe only unfolds one way. But in a two-dimensional model, an event in time can be caused by an infinite number of points. Any possible point can be causal to any possible event, and multiple points can be causal to the same event. This infinity is multiplied by another infinity if we were to add a third parallel dimension of time. Furthermore, if the way we experience the world is limited to just the x-axis of time, then when things are caused by other parallel dimensions of time, we have no way to detect it. Reality unfolds in multiple dimensions of time, yet we only notice one. Just as reality contains more colors than we can observe, which would either mean that we're sometimes, or even always, wrong about the thing that we think caused something, or that something would look like nothing caused it, and yet it happened anyway. Which is to say that it would appear as spontaneous, or truly randomly generated. Remember that quantum physics seems to suggest that things do occur without a cause. Things do come from nowhere. So it's hypothetically possible that these uncaused events actually have their cause in other timelines. Before, I mentioned that we'll add these two extra dimensions of time together to make a three-dimensional box model of time. So let's disregard my doubts that time depth doesn't deserve to be treated as a second dimension of time and treat it as one anyway. This would put linear time on the x-axis. We might call this the directionality of time. Time depth on the y-axis and parallel time on the z-axis. Perhaps our consciousness experiences a narrow time slice, a one-dimensional cross-section of a multi-dimensional graph of time. And the directionality of time is only one direction that time flows in. And because this is the only direction that we experience, it's the only direction that we think exists. I actually think it's better to say that time doesn't flow at all, but that it could be thought of as something like a fluid that fills the three-dimensional box. This would be a kind of block universe made of time. For the metaphor's sake, this requires us to change up the axes so that the directionality of time is on the y-axis instead of the x. In this box, you are a particle falling straight down. Sometimes the fluid experiences waves. Maybe something shakes the box, or for some other reason, the particle gets thrust in a different direction for a short while, allowing us to experience alternate realities, to feel an eternity in a single moment, to feel time rush by, or to be thrust into the past or the future. Perhaps, with a full understanding of time being a three-dimensional fluid, if it was one, and the right technology and or conscious state, we could have the ability to swim freely through time in the direction of our choice. Not just up, which would be back through linear time, but along an entirely different directional axis, perhaps into infinities or into other pathways of time, what we might think of as an alternate universe or parallel worlds or the multiverse. Now, thinking back to the graphs of time length versus time width, where we found multi-causality, you might be thinking, how could an event in one timeline affect an event in a different timeline? Well, if time is a fluid in a box, then perhaps like other fluids, changes ripple outward to affect other parts of the fluid, or other timelines. Keep in mind that I'm using the language of space to talk about this time box. Up, down, close by, that kind of thing. It's just for ease of understanding. But we should also keep in mind that space and time are in some way interlinked, or at least time and gravity are. So this three-dimensional time box is a way to conceptualize time by itself, but time wouldn't be by itself. It would be interconnected with all the other dimensions of space. Higher dimensions, I think, is what Plato's cave is really about. Of course, Plato's cave is also about an ultimate source of things. It uses the hypothetical example of people who have only ever seen in two dimensions. And because that's all they've ever seen, that's all they think there is. And how we do this, but with our three-dimensional world. Of course, religious people like to use Plato's cave as an argument for God, and Plato also used it as an argument for God. Plato liked to think of a dimension of ideals, where things come from, like how the shadows on the walls come from a fire and the people standing behind it. But I think the real point of Plato's cave, that perhaps Plato couldn't really put into words and his ideal forms were his best attempt at expressing this, is higher dimensions. Less in the sense of an ultimate reality, but in additional layers of reality that we're naturally blind to. That type of thing evokes God for a lot of people, 
But saying that there's more to this world than what we perceive isn't the same thing as claiming that there's a god. I'm not claiming that there's a god, but I am speculating that there's more to this universe than the three-dimensional world that we perceive. Four-dimensional if you count time. Especially if string theory is correct. It's possible that we visit the width dimension of time in our sleep, experiencing other realities rather than creating fictional scenarios, or maybe a mix of both. Perhaps some dreams are fictitious things that we make up and don't exist in reality, and other dreams are our experience of ourselves in a different timeline. J.W. Dunn, who I mentioned earlier, thought that in our dreams, our experience of time becomes unshackled to the present and we can experience the past and the future. It might even be possible that our consciousness permeates the entirety of this three-dimensional time fluid, but our focus is only on that one narrow time slice, such that if you traveled along times with access to a parallel world, it would feel very familiar and comfortable to you because you live there too. It wouldn't be like you number one is taking over you number seven's body if you traveled to parallel world number seven. It wouldn't really be a different you. It would be you. There is only one you, but stretched across all time dimensions. You live in all of them all the time, but ordinarily the you that you feel you are is unaware of the other yous. It might be helpful to think of this like strings in a box rather than a fluid. Normally you move down the same string, and the perimeter of the box is your lifespan, with your birth at the top of the box and your death at the bottom of the box. And sometimes the string bends, which is time depth. But you can also hypothetically travel to a different string. The different string is still you, and it feels no less like you than the previous string did, because the strings all represent you scattered throughout the width of time. This sort of thing kind of relies on the theory of brains being receivers of consciousness rather than creators of consciousness being true, which to be honest, I don't find all that plausible. Essentially the idea is that consciousness exists outside of our brains and somewhat like our eyes evolving to become sensitive to the existence of light and color, our brains evolve to become sensitive to the existence of this free flowing consciousness. Rather than brains being machines that create the experience of consciousness, they're like, radios that pick up a signal. One thing this theory has to account for is the fact that changing brains changes consciousness. Like the classic example of Phineas Gage, who got a pole through his frontal lobe and subsequently exhibited a completely different personality for the rest of his life. So maybe it's somewhat like a radio, in the sense that if you damage a radio, you damage the radio's ability to function. It's not a perfect analogy by any means. One question to be asked is, if our brains are picking up and manipulating this pre-existing consciousness, why do we experience separate streams of consciousness from each other? One answer might be that because our brains are each constructed uniquely, that we each manipulate consciousness in a unique way. One half answer is found in the idea of collective consciousness. We don't truly experience separate streams of consciousness. We all have a connected consciousness, only that consciousness is hidden from you. It's a subconscious connection. Another answer might be that the whole idea of brains as receivers of consciousness is incorrect, and they really do create their own conscious experience in a straightforward and non-mystical way. And the events that can seemingly be explained by the existence of a collective consciousness would be instead attributed to things like cultural osmosis, our shared human biology and psychology, and the underlying consistency of the human experience. Anyway, taking this idea of an exterior consciousness a step further, somewhere outside the box containing all these strings, these strings might connect, and that is the whole you, your complete consciousness, or what J.W. Dunn called the superlative general observer, which in a new agey way is basically God. If you could somehow travel outside of this block universe, whether time contains multiple dimensions or just one, it would essentially be the God's eye view of the universe. Not that I believe God exists, but if one could do that, then one would, in a sense, become God. While inside the block universe, time seems to flow. Events happen and everything seems to be a moving process. It's a verb, or maybe it's a collection of verbs. Standing outside of space-time, this verb universe would appear as a noun. You could observe the universe in all space and time, all past and future, and parallel worlds if it's a block universe with multidimensional time, 
in just one moment. Moment isn't the right word for it because you'd be outside of time. But essentially, you would see everything in its entirety. All the intricacy of the universe would be like a painting on a wall. And this perspective on reality might be so much more all-encompassing than our narrow slice that it makes our narrow slice seem like nothing at all. In the same way that being a single-celled organism would seem like nothing to us right now, our current experience might seem like nothing to an observer outside of space-time. Whether your complete consciousness is in fact the same thing as everyone else's complete consciousness, who could say? Many people seem to be a fan of the idea that there's some consciousness at large, and our individual consciousness experiences a piece of that whole that we go back to after our death. It's a cool idea, made accessible by Andy Weir's story, The Egg. If the box model, whether strings or fluid, were accurate, that suggests to me that traveling back up the string couldn't possibly change anything. It would allow you to prolong your conscious experience on that string, but it would simply be a revisitation of what has already happened. This would be like Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, where the main character is unstuck in time. He experiences the events of his life out of order, but the events aren't subject to change. In this way, it would seem hypothetically possible that you never truly die, but rather you swim throughout your memories continuously. A bit like Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, where you live your life on repeat forever. In order to find time travel in the sense that things are different, you'd have to travel to a completely different time string. Parallel worlds, basically. This would be a way to swim through reality in a way that you could basically find whatever experience that you wanted to find. It would essentially be like standing outside of the block universe, as you're free to peruse it at your leisure. This consciousness at large stands away from the universe. To get a good look, it focuses on small parts at a time. Its view comes to a single point when it touches the block universe. Where that single point of conscious attention touches this map of the universe is where slash when you experience yourself to be. Consciousness at large traces its sight mostly steadily along one axis, and that is your lifetime. All time is happening at once, or has already happened, or appears as a still image. And consciousness, I guess with a capital C in this case, is spending its existence rereading it. It's getting to know the map, looking for stories. It's like reality is a word search, or a book. A book sitting on your coffee table is finished. The entirety of the story is contained within it, but you don't read it all at once. You read it line by line from beginning to end. You can skip around if you like, you can dwell on certain pages longer than others, and you can reread it. But it's best experienced in a linear order. Thinking about a consciousness that stands outside of time brings to mind yet another idea of what higher dimensions of time might look like. When you read a book, or watch a movie, or engage in any sort of storytelling, there's a sort of dual timeline going on. Time is passing for you as you read the book, but there's also the timeline of the story, and of the characters within the story. We could call this inner time and outer time. If we suppose that this imaginary consciousness really does stand outside of time, what does that even mean? Does that even make sense? If time doesn't occur, can anything happen? So perhaps a higher dimension of time is the time that exists outside of the block universe. From within the block universe, time seems to move, but outside of the block universe, their time seems to move, and the time within the block universe seems to be still or finished. It's merely descriptive rather than experienced. More like a memory than anything else. As I said, the book has already been written. So it's as if this larger consciousness is experiencing our universe after it's come to an end. And there could actually be a way, an admittedly far-fetched way, in which this is physically, literally true. But this requires a further explanation of dimensions in terms of space. One dimension of space is simply a line. That's all it can be. It can be an extremely short line or an infinitely long line, but it only travels along one axis and has no thickness whatsoever. Two dimensions, now things get interesting. Two dimensions is a plane. Here you can create things as simple as squares or as complex as paintings or photographs that look as if they're three-dimensional when really they're not. And three dimensions adds depth. This is the world we inhabit. Or at least it's the world that we observe. Every object that we interact with has depth. When we say that a painting is two-dimensional, it's not technically true because really it has depth. Anyway, this line is one-dimensional. You can see all of it. Because it has no depth, it has no back or sides. It is only this. This is a circle. It's two-dimensional. You can see all of it. Because this has no depth, 
it has no back or sides. This is a sphere, or at least pretty close to a sphere. It's three-dimensional. You can't see all of it. It has a backside, so at any given moment, the best that you can do is see about half of it. Not to mention the inside of it, which you can't see any of. We experience the world in three dimensions, and when we see something that's three-dimensional, we can't see all of it at once. If we were somehow two-dimensional beings, then when we looked at a two-dimensional object, such as a circle, then we couldn't see all of it. It would appear very much to a two-dimensional observer the same way that a sphere appears to a three-dimensional observer. Half of it, or more, would be hidden. So generally speaking, if a thing has fewer dimensions than the amount of dimensions that you're able to detect, you are able to see all of it at once. You could say that it's open. If a thing has more or as many dimensions as we're able to detect, you can't see all of it at once. You could say that it's a closed object. If instead of observing the world in three dimensions, we could somehow instead observe it in four, then we could completely see all of any three-dimensional object. All three-dimensional objects would be open to us. If in this four-dimensional observing state, you looked at a sphere, you could see all of it at once. And not just the outer shell, but including what's on the inside as well. For a four-dimensional observer, um, four dimensions meaning dimensions of space, I'm not including time in this, then looking at a sphere would be just like how we look at circles. It would be more complex of an image of a circle, just like how a circle is more complex than a line, but still, it would be open. If you looked at a person's body, you would be able to see every part of that person's body, including all of their insides. Light travels on for infinity, basically. And for a four-dimensional observer, they wouldn't have to worry about things like walls obstructing the path of light, because you could see around the walls. Everything in a three-dimensional universe would be open to you. So in these conditions, all sources of light are effectively emanating lights out in all directions, out to the edge of the universe and beyond. Imagine that our universe is contained within a bubble, or better yet, a sort of lens. All the light that has ever been, or will ever be, inside the universe hits that lens. And this lens projects the image to be developed in a sort of higher dimensional dark room for processing the entire history of other universes. Everything that ever happens within our universe gets recorded for perusal by higher dimensional beings who perhaps have their own flow of time where reading the history of an entire universe is comparable to reading a novel. And perhaps these beings have a method of actually living the stories that they read, such that you are that higher dimensional being, and time depth is the speed at which they read, and parallel time is all the stories from other universes. Or not. Remember not to take any of this about multidimensional time, and especially about godlike consciousness as being true, but rather what's theoretically possible, but mostly just what's interesting to think about. I'm not trying to turn anyone into pseudo-scientific mystics who think that they're literally God. I just like to talk about fun ideas. But if you did go around thinking that every conscious creature shares the consciousness of a higher dimensional being that is actually, at the same time, you, it might make you crazy, but at the very least it would expand your sense of self and make you much more empathetic. Thanks for watching, remember not to take it all that seriously, and let me know your thoughts down in the comments.